The Oklahoma Sooners had a great weekend up in Lawrence, Kansas. Alex Sirocco joins the show to break it all down and get us ready for OU Texas down in Austin on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you for joining us for another edition of the Alex Tarocco Show here on Locked On Sooners. And thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. I'm John Williams. He's Josh Helmer and she's Alex Tarocco. We're going to get into a lot of what happened over the weekend with Oklahoma and Kansas. We're also going to touch on what's coming up in the Red River rivalry as well. But let's start with Kelly Maxwell's performance in the opener last Thursday against the Kansas Jayhawks. Took a no-no deep into the seventh inning, was again phenomenal, and then had it broken up you know, on the, on the solo shot. But talk about her performance just out of the gate because she has really become a tone center for the Sooners in their weekend series. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, with the anticipation of, you know, the Kansas series and how they've kind of made their mark um, so far this season, like you said, like she really set the tone for the rest of the weekend, I think, in just the way that she was able to just command her presence, her pitches, and just be able to dominate on all sides of the ball. I mean, for her to take a no-no into six and two-thirds, I mean, she was an out and away from a seven inning um, no-no, I think, that just kind of describes it in its in itself. Um, she's had so much growth, I think, while wearing the crimson and cream thus far. And so for I think for me, too, it's really exciting to see, you know, an older transfer still have that growth, even though like you think you're like, OK, I've been through college softball four years. Like, how much more can I learn? Um, and I think you see that out of Kelly. I think she's just dominating. She's always really dominated through um you know, the big 12 in her career, but I feel like she's taking it to another level here at OU. And I'm really excited for her and just being able to see that success for her. And then also just seeing the offense back her up the entire weekend and um, that rest of the game too. What is being a part of the chase of a no hitter? Like what's it like for the dugout? What does it do mentally in the circle to a pitcher? I mean, what are sort of those moments like? Um, I think it varies for everyone. Um, like for me, I, I, one, didn't really know. Or if I did, like I didn't talk about it. We didn't, like, we're going to talk about offense. We're going to talk about anything but pitching. Like even to the sense of like, I don't even converse with like Kinsey. I'm like, hey, like where's, you know, this this ball breaking today or everything. Um And so I think, you know, obviously it's different for everyone, but I think with just the tension that's in the air, it is a little different. You kind of feel it and you're like, I'm not even going to look at the scoreboard. I don't want to know. And then it comes to find out where it's just like, oh my gosh, like it happened. And I've had two in my career in college and um, both times I would honestly go to say that like, I had no idea where the ball was going. They were games that like, I wouldn't say were my best, but ended up being very good. And I think that is just, I think the pinnacle of pitching in itself, like you could have, you know, a great day where your ball is moving and you're locating really well. And sometimes hitters are just hitting it and you're like, well, dang, like everything is working. And then you have the days where it's like, I'm working the catcher like tough and I don't know where the ball is going. She doesn't know where the ball is going, which only adds up to a hitter, not knowing what's coming out of like your hand. And so um, those are the days you think your catch catcher a little extra because there's those moments where I'm like, I'm sorry, but I think it worked out in our favor in the long run. Um, so I think that's, you know, a fun aspect of it. And um, I think all pitchers are a little different because I've known pitchers throughout my career that they're like, no, yeah, let's talk about it. And me, I'm like kind of superstitious in a way. And, and I'm like, I don't want to know, like, I don't even want to know if I have, you know, a low hit game or anything. Um, and so like, that's me, like I'll look into stats after a game, but like during, like, I don't want to talk about it very tunnel vision half the time. I don't even know the score kind of deal. So I think that's part of it too. 
Yeah, just going up there trying to take care of business a little bit. You know, to to quote Michael Scott, I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little bit stitious. Um, and, and, you know, playing baseball growing up, like that's the thing, like no hitter, perfect game. You never talk about it. You just focus on the next batter. But you're right. There is that building tension that occurs, like even amongst the fan base, like the fan bases won't even talk about it because nobody wants to be the one that, that jinxes it. But there's a growing tension and a growing buzz, uh, you know, even if you're just pitching a nice shutout game, you know, is there a, a different sense of pressure that kind of builds or, or are you still locked in in such a way that I'm just worried about the next pitch, the next batter. I, I don't know what the score is. I think when you break it down in that way, that's what makes a pitcher go from good to great. When you focus on a, you know, one pitch focus. Um, I love, you know, teaching, whether that's I'm at a camp or anything, like a big part of like a mindset that really made me good was focusing on one pitch only. And like, I learned that at Michigan, but when I tell you it was emphasized to a great deal at Oklahoma, um, you learn to truly buy into that in a different way. Um, And a phrase that kind of stuck out to me was having like a goldfish memory. That's from, uh, um, I can't think of the show. Ted Lasso. Right yes, Ted Lasso. Be a goldfish, Sam. Be a goldfish. Yes, be a goldfish. And so, like, that was something that, like, I continue to to preach when I'm, you know, working with pitchers, um, whether that's mentality or just, I think, in the game of softball itself, I think it works for a hitter and a pitcher um, in, any, in any way, shape, or form. And so, when you buy into that, I think that's when you, like, don't care where the last pitch was because this next one matters Um immensely and then whether it it hits your spot or it moves or whatever and that's great then you put it past you and you go to the next one and I think that's a key thing that once you figure out as a pitcher that's when you go like next level in your game and and using your pitches in a different way and so um I I love hearing when you know pitchers finally figure it out because like you can learn it as much as you can, you can talk about it, but as soon as it clicks, that's a whole different story. And so I think like those moments are, are really cool. What else stood out about the pitching that was obviously Kelly Maxwell, understandably it generates a, a lot of the headlines after what happened in the series opener. But what did you think about the rest of Oklahoma's pitching? I mean, I think the rest of the OU's pitching was great. I think it's uh, crazy that in game two and game three, there was, quite literally everyone else was used other than Kelly because she had such a standout first game. And so when you like break down the numbers and when I was breaking down numbers, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like everyone threw these games and stuff. So when you add that into it, you're like, wow, they can, they can shut down offenses in a ton of different ways and not just having to rely on, you know, Kelly throwing two out of three games or, um, a game and a half every weekend. Like they can go to it in so many different combinations on, you know, game two, you have May and then you have SJ and Peyton all come in and, you know, then Sunday you got KD starting, Carly coming in and SJ Peyton and Nicole, like the whole crew is adding to all of it. So when you're able to provide that many different looks to an offense as, you know, killer has that Kansas has been lately and just kind of on fire, they really put, you know, the water on them and just kind of set them all free. And that's when you're able to really dominate in another way that, you know, OU has really bought in into and coach Gasso Gasso has really bought into as well, because you're changing the game in in the sense of you're going from having just a sole ace that you rely on to a whole staff that you're able to rely on and throw in there. I mean, um, SJ gave up her first run of the season and, you know, it's end of March. I think that's that's crazy, too, for her to have limited appearances and do as well as she's done. Um, that's a big deal. And then you have different pitchers being able to come in in different situations. And so I think that's only growing their experience under their belt for, you know, the second half of the season. Yeah, and as the second half of the season goes, or as we get closer to the the big series, you know, Texas is coming up. You got Oklahoma State still. Oklahoma's offense is really, really heating up. This Kansas Jayhawks team came into the series second in Big 12 play and runs allowed. We're going to talk about all of the offensive performances that uh, were unleashed on the Jayhawks this past weekend in Lawrence. Coming up next here with Alex Sirocco on Locked On Sooners. 
Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV, whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a fire TV fire TV recently created fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us here at locked on and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels, let you dive into all of the game analysis highlights and more to keep up to date on all of the latest in the world of sports, March madness, NBA, major league baseball, and so much much more not to mention great news entertainment gaming travel cooking videos as well check out fire tv channels on fire tv and alexa devices if you haven't checked out fire tv channels you should trust us on this to learn more visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire tv of play and runs allowed we're going to talk about all of the offensive performances that uh, were unleashed on the jayhawks this past weekend in lawrence coming up next here with alex Sirocco on locked on sooners So the Oklahoma Sooners came into the week having won the last three Big 12 Player of the Week awards, Sidney Sanders, Tiara Jennings, and then Elena Torres. Tiara also won National Player of the Week award. And then, lo and behold, we get another one. It's Jada Coleman this time. It's her turn to get the Big 12 Player of the Week award and also won the NFCA National Player of the Week award as well. Hit 857 in the three games. You can't get much better than that, Alex. No, you really can't. And when... You know, you just look at the performance and kind of the just leading up to this weekend, too. I feel like from the start, everyone was like, oh, like, where's Jada Coleman? Like, she's not hitting. Um, And then Mary Nutter came along and she hit her first home run. And everyone's like, just hold on. Like, this is similar to last year. And she ended up being a player of the year contender kind of deal. Um, But you kind of see that morphing into this season, too. And so for her to really just, you know, settle in, I mean, she goes two for three, two for two and two for two and just has a ton of RBIs. She's patient. Not only is she hitting the ball, she has, you know, the patience with, you know, the amount of walks that she has. She's, she's providing in a lot of different ways other than just keeping your bat hot. And I think that's probably, probably one of the most like influx parts of the game is staying hot consistently. And so when you're able to provide in a lot of different ways, um, you know, Jada's, you know, rely reliable in the sense of just getting on base. I can only imagine her on base percentage right now and throughout her career because she's someone, you know, like Alyssa Brito that gets so intensely fired up when it comes to, you know, getting a walk and getting a free base. And so when you watch her play, it's kind of just addicting in the way that you, you watch her in her at bats. She's so sure of her choices, no matter if it's a ball or a strike, she's like, yep, this is what I think it is. And um, that's, you know, amazing. She gets on no matter if it's a hit or a walk or anything like that. And then she's taking every base that she's going to, you know, take from you. And whether that's you're paying attention, you're not paying attention, you know, a lot of the beginning of the season, everyone's like, maybe she's too aggressive, but that's just how Jada Coleman plays the game is she's just going to take as much as you're going to give her and more. And so she's just such a fun, you know, softball player to watch. And she's one of those few that, you know, her play has continued to grow the game no matter how successful she is. And um, when you look at her career, she's just been so fun. So it was cool to see her kind of have that breakout and that, you know, table setting role um, for the weekend and um, another tone setter when it comes to the weekend with um, pairing up with Kansas. 22 game on base streak for Jada Coleman, uh, 589 uh on base percentage this season 466 batting average so she's she's doing everything the the power surge for somebody like jada coleman that defensively the the ground that she covers uh the speed on the base paths to have the power supply ability with all of that how unique is it I think the power comes with it for me it's her ability to drop a bunt like riley boone i think that like propels the power even more because in many of times she's done already even this season and in her career she'll hit a leadoff 
start of the game home run and next at bat she comes and drops a bunt down and is able is at first base before they can even you know pick the ball up and so when you add that dimension to her game um it just is it you just can't even describe it because it's like who else can do that um but then you look at OU's lineup and you're like oh well she can do that and she can do that because like there's so much you know talent on OU's roster but then you look elsewhere in the country and it's really no one else is buying into that triple threat um mentality when it, especially when it comes to a lefty um so for you know coach gasso to have someone like jada coleman and riley boone and then you know really kind of helping the rest of like the young ones really develop into that um i think that's really cool too and and jada she's just so fun i mean she wears her emotions on her sleeve and you know that's what i love about her just because i'm a very similar player in that way um but she's been so cool to watch and, you know, look up to even as a teammate now. And, you know, even though she's younger than me, she's growing the game in a lot of different ways. And, you know, um, she's handled it like a pro. And what does it do for a pitcher when you have somebody that plays center field the way that she plays? I mean, she's she's Andrew Jones. You know, if you're an old baseball fan or Atlanta Braves fan, like she's just maybe one of the best of all time at playing the center field position how much more comfort do you get when you're out there throwing? You're like, I don't care if it's a liner to shallow center, Jada's going to come up with it. Yeah. I think that's how you just feel as a pitcher on Oklahoma, no matter, you know, who's behind you in any kind of position, but Jada Coleman, the range that she has, the ability that she has to, you know, rob home runs in such clutch moments, the diving, you know, her diving ability, but also her arm. Like you can, you can make great catches, but for her to make great catches or play the ball super well, and then be able to throw out a runner who's, you know, think they have a stand up double at second and they're out by miles. I think, you know, those are some of my favorite plays ever. And um, you don't see a ton of outfield that like play like that across the country. So when you have, Jada Coleman, Riley Boone, and, you know, these freshmen that are adapting into that. And it just makes the game so much more fun and cool. And, you know, some of those highlights that maybe you don't really think are going to happen or anything. And so when you catch the other team kind of slacking off or, you know, playing to expectations, it's like, nope, just kidding. We're going to deny you a double because, you know, you weren't paying attention. You don't know who you're playing. Um, I think that just adds to adds the fuel to the fire in a lot of different ways. Jada Coleman, of course, the NFCA National Player of the Week, Big 12 Player of the Week, as John mentioned. But one, two, three in the order for Oklahoma was incredible this weekend. Jada, what she did, T.R.A. Jennings, Alyssa Brito, one, two, three in the order. How impressive was that from Oklahoma this weekend? I mean, I think that is just an additional threat when you think about how you want to, if you're opposing pitcher and you want to get off to a good start and you have to face Jada, Brito, and Tiari, um, you're like, where am I even supposed to pitch the ball to get off to a good start? Because I feel like they hit strikes well, but they hit balls well even better sometimes because you look at replays of home runs and you're like, how did she hit a pitch that low out? Or how did she pitch a, a hit a ball like, you know, that far outside in such a well placed area? Like, I think the coverage that they have of a zone is um, insane because they're not just swinging out of their shoes. They do it with purpose in every, in every kind of quadrant of the strike zone, but then they also know when to not swing and provide, you know, well, you know, timed walks in a lot of ways. If you, if you look at the three of them, they have great numbers and, you know, walks and everything. So when you have that kind of triple threat at the start, you're like, I, I don't even – I can't even imagine what it would feel like because, thankfully, I only had, you know, fall ball. And so we were kind of shaken up a little bit with lineups and everything. But, you know, even then it was like, oh, my gosh, like where am I even supposed to pitch the ball? Because they're hitting they're hitting strikes super well and they're hitting balls really well. And I think that's when it can really get to a pitcher of, like, that was a good pitcher's pitch or a good ball and they're hitting them out or, you know, for a double and, and things of that nature. So I think that – can really get into like the nitty gritty of, you know, in the head of a pitcher in a lot of different ways. And it wasn't as if Casey Hamilton, Kansas's pitcher was throwing bad. She was pitch pitching pretty well in her two starts. It's just Oklahoma's lineup is nonstop. And, 
you know, even if you get a Sydney Sanders swinging or, or you, you know, get TRA one time, you're not going to get her every time. And it, it just keeps coming. It's like an avalanche, you know, just one person gets going and everybody else gets going. That's 17 run outburst in game two. I don't even really have the words to put with it. That, that just every time I think I've, I've got a handle on what Oklahoma is capable of, they go out and they do something like that and they completely surprise me. Absolutely. And and like you said, you know, Casey Hamilton, honestly, threw, I thought, pretty well in just regards of movement, location, and a lot of those ways. I mean, heading into the weekend, she's her batting average against opponents was, you know, 207. And for that as a pitcher, like that's pretty good um, when you're when you're keeping, you know, batters to kind of that lower um, batting average in the sense. And so and I feel like Kansas really kind of had a lot of momentum going into this series and Kelly Maxwell crushed it. Jada Tiare, Jada Tiare um, Brito crushed it. And so it's just, it's crazy how they can take a team who's kind of riding a high and really just, you know, bring them back to reality in a way and um, really kind of show them, you know, Oklahoma softball. So when you have to go up against said batters in intra squad in fall ball, how do you, how do you take that experience and a stay positive if it doesn't go well against those hitters and then b on the other end of the equation how how much confidence do you gain from you know it's probably i'm not going to see a lineup like this again yeah i think the fall is one of the hardest things for um especially a graduate transfer who from your previous school, you had so much success. You've had all these, you know, individual awards and all these great stats and everything. And you're like, okay, like I'm good enough. And, you know, I'm, I'm this good of a pitcher that I got recruited to Oklahoma. So you're like, obviously I'm, I'm pretty good. And then you go and you have to face them, not only just, you know, those four or five games that they have scheduled, but in between those games, we're still scrimmaging whether the camera's on or not. So these girls are getting, you know, at bats off of you day in and day out. And then of course you get on TV and you're like, wow, like they absolutely have my number. Like, I don't know what else I can throw to them unless I, you know, make up a new pitch in the, in that, in a sense. And so um, it is super frustrating. And there was a lot of nights where I was just like frustrated and I'm like, I don't know like why I'm not getting it done in a way, but then also too, like you said, like I had the biggest relief after fall ball was done and like, sweet, I'll never have to throw to them again. Um, I'll never have to face a lineup like that. Uh, I think that adds to the confidence. And so like when it comes to it, like season and you're playing other teams, it, it doesn't feel nearly as taxing um, mentally, emotionally, you know, physically, um, when it comes down to like the nitty gritty of comparison of, you know, the two. And so I think that adds to a lot of confidence, but then also that, you know, difference in, you know, relaxation on the mound. It's like, okay, cool. Like I'm not throwing a Tiari Jennings, you know, national player of the week every other week in a, in a sense. And so that I think adds to a lot of that. And then on top of, you know, scouting and, and being able to, learn from film and in a lot of that ways I know Kelly and I were very similar in the fact that we didn't do film at our previous schools and so learning that is a lot and then you know once you get the hang of it you're like oh, okay this makes a lot of sense and you know adds more to your confidence um, when you go and attack hitters uh, for the weekend. Yeah, and the Oklahoma Sooners is going to have a lot of confidence getting ready for the Red River rivalry this weekend down in Austin, Texas. We're going to get Alex's take on the Texas Longhorns. Also, we're going to talk about her, uh, the new number two in softball, who Alex has been pumping up for quite some time here on Locked On Sooners coming up next. The sports calendar, it is loaded up, and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Why is that? Well, that's because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on the final moments, the final four of the tourney, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet a big win. Uh, again, uh, some of those numbers that are out there, a couple of uh, hefty favorites, 
uh, UConn, Purdue, collision course to play for the title. The the odds makers think so. Purdue favored by nine and a half. UConn, 11 and a half points. But there's odds on Zach Eady is the most outstanding player. Tristan Newton, you name it. Uh, you can check it all out again with uh, FanDuel. That's America's number one sports book. Again, thank you so much for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button to let you know when new episodes drop. So, Alex, it's OU Texas weekend. This time it's down in Austin. You got to experience this last year, partly at Hall of Fame Stadium in Oklahoma City and then in Norman. What was the the feeling in the sense that you got kind of coming into this rivalry? Because, you, you know, former Michigan star, you were a part of Michigan, Ohio State for several years. A lot of bad blood between those two programs and a lot of sports. So what was your feeling as you went into OU Texas for the first time? Um, just super pumped up in a lot of ways. Um, I love the rivalry aspect, you know, having, you know, that chip on your shoulder and playing for, you know, not just an outcome, but also a little bit of bragging rights in a sense of, um just because of how big and notorious the rivalries are in, you know, sports in a lot of different ways. I've gotten to play for two of the most notorious rivalries. And I think that's so cool to say in a lot of ways. Um, but I think Texas was so fun because there's so much like stories behind all of it. I mean, you add just like the characters that go into play, whether that's, you know, Mike White for the week, you know, having, saying something to media that's really just going to light some fire under a lot of people butts and so i think that adds to the fire i think just you know the history of of the rivalry within softball itself not even you know football or all those other aspects but you know when it comes to softball there's so many moments that are very um you know high up there and so it was it was intense i loved it like i love that kind of um just anticipation for that kind of uh, rivalry and everything in the series. Um, I was pumped that it was at home because I'm like, I had never been to Austin before. So, um, and just to see that environment at Merida and everything. And I think it was, it was so much fun. And, you know, with what Texas brings to the, to the table with a lot of their um, tools on their roster, that week, I, I'll never forget it. It was like one of the most probably defensive, grueling weeks of practice um, just because of, you know, they're a very um, efficient team in a lot of ways and they get things done and um, they're a big base running team and they're, they just find a lot of ways to, you know, get on. Um, last year, they didn't have a ton of power, um, so they got it done and they were still good even though they were young and um, inexperienced. I feel like they bring that. Um, to the table this year of like being young, but now they have the experience of, you know, playing in good series and, and everything. So I'm excited to see for, you know, how this series goes. And I didn't watch, you know, 2022's series at Austin and everything. So I'm excited to really dive into just the atmosphere and everything. So um, I'm excited for this series and especially with just both anticipation of both teams being so good this year, truthfully, like, I know we're Oklahoma, but you know what Texas has done in the growth, like they have really provided a lot of power experience, just fun watching softball um, in the product that they're producing. Um, so I think this weekend is going to be probably one of the most anticipated slates of the weekend across the country. How much do you have to stay away from the rivalry component as you build up to it? Because, you know, something you said – there's only so much you can escape, right? If Mike White's going to say something about Oklahoma, probably in some capacity, that's going to make it back to you that week. H how do you sort of deal with the rivalry angle in, in the buildup to the, the games themselves? Yeah, I think um, I'm really big on this too. Like I love the rivalry, but I love it in a sports sense and not really as like a fan viewer sense in a way because of, me being an athlete the last five, six years, like it has really kind of taken a toll in the way that social media has opened the gates of, you know, the athletes seeing people's opinions. And so I've been so big on that in my career um, with, you know, mental health within student athletes um, is such a big thing. And so 
I encourage girls, teammates, myself, even trying to stay off of social media, um, kind of that leak. A week leading up to it. I know some girls just kind of delete social like for like season, which I think is huge and not just in softball, but a lot of other athletes I know kind of do that for their season and everything. Um, so I think that's key. Um, but I also think too, like, yes, a rivalry is so intense in a lot of different ways, but these are also humans. They're, you know, 17, 23 year old girls that people are tweeting about or everything about. And so me, I, I become, I feel like now I've become like kind of a mama bear in a, in a way of trying to defend, you know, the people that, you know, I support and love because, you know, yes, they're, they're athletes, but they're humans too. So they make mistakes. And I think that's a really thing, big thing to kind of keep in the back of your head when, you know, just think that you have a free for all on social media. And I think that is what makes me so mad is that athletes, our entire lives have kind of been told and coached of like, whatever you put on social media, like it can't be deleted and it's on there forever and everyone sees it. And I feel like people who weren't ever athletes don't understand that. And so they think that they can tweet wherever, whatever they want. But in reality, like you're tweeting about someone who has, you know, a life, you know, parents, sisters, all that, like brothers in a way, like they're people before, like before they're an athlete. And I think what I love too is like, a lot of the girls on this OU team and even in just that have had the platforms that athletics has have given them are very just supportive and emphasis in like person before athlete um, in like taking, you know, mental health into an aspect. So I think that's always like one of my biggest things about rivalry week. I know I kind of went on a tyrant during like football season and I feel like with all of it too, like, it just is such a big factor when it comes to, you know, student athletes. I mean, you look at, you know, everything going viral after, you know, the women's basketball games this week with, you know, Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese and Haley Van Lith. Like there's so much being said about those girls and reality, like they're, they're girls too, and they're humans too. And um, they see that stuff, whether they try to block it out or not. Yeah. The, the social media movement has kind of given everybody that platform to become an analyst and a lot of times it goes beyond analysis of their performance and and, and, it, and it's a tough thing and it's something one thing i've learned in covering sports for the last eight years or so um and i actually learned it from nfl draft analysts it's like focus on the positive things that people can do to help player help a team win and don't dog so much the negative things everybody's got weaknesses not, there's not a perfect player out there in any sport and any field ever. And so focus on the things they do well. And then I've just kind of learned like, Hey, there's no reason to criticize people if you don't need to. It's just, you know, yes, you can be, you can critique and you can analyze. And sometimes you have to do that, but yeah, there's, there's some of that that just goes way beyond um, just that aspect. All right. Couple of final questions here. More fans. What's that? Yeah. Be fans. Just be fans. Enjoy the game. You don't have to analyze everything. A um, couple more questions here. Duke, they've had a phenomenal year so far. What do you think their chances are of being in that final series uh, in Oklahoma City? You know, I think they have a great record in the sense of, you know, who they've played. I think they kind of have that. I remember talking about it week one with you guys of, us, of just them having a solid core of like returning like veterans when it comes to their roster and their lineup and everything. So they have that experience. They have, you know, kind of that chip on their shoulder of, you know, the new and up and coming ACC team. Um, and I think the quality of softball that they're playing on the field right now is is the highest that it's been in, in a lot of ways of, you know, really setting the table up right. Um, they're dominating. They're doing well pitching wise, hitting wise. They're getting it done on all, all spectrums and everything. So they're another kind of um, fun team to watch in a lot of ways. And I think it's so cool what they've done in such a short time of having a softball program. So um, big emphasis on that as well. And so they've been a cool team to follow and um, excited for them. And I hope they get to make it to the women's college world series. I think that'd be really cool um, in just a storyline in a lot of sense too. And then Oklahoma, you know, just ends the Cinderella story. Yes, um, yeah. Final question here with Alex Sirocco on Locked On Sooners comes from Ethan Shoemake on Facebook. He asks, what was it like working, working with Coach Rocha 
and then heading into the professional side of the game? Um, Coach Rocha was, you know, so fun to work with. Um, I know I've said it with media before of like, she was kind of like, like a mother to the pitchers. And so she is just so kind of soft spoken, but like knows how to get a message across. Um, and then being able to work with, you know, the different types of pitchers that you have, whether that's like literally within, you know, different pitches, but also just personalities as well. Um, and it takes a special kind of person to work with pitchers. I feel like, um, I don't know if I've said it on here before, like you have to be a little kind of crazy to be a pitcher in a sense. Um, so when you're able to just like really get all of your pitchers to buy in and have a great attitude when it comes to, you know, working bullpens in and out and, you know, dealing with, you know, players that, could have a good day and bad day. Like she's so just calming. She brings such a calming sense and just settles you down and in a different way that you would maybe expect out of, you know, a pitching coach or um, a coach at this kind of level. And so um, it's been so fun to work with her and I've, I've totally missed her in the, in the, in the pro sense and everything. And pro ball gives such a different perspective in a lot of different ways um, with, you know, so many different things. Um, so she is a great pitching coach and, you know, I'm so fortunate that I got to work with someone like her who's produced just, you know, athlete on athlete um, when it comes to, you know, the pitching circle. Yeah. And we're, we're thankful to have her in uh, Norman as part of Oklahoma's coaching staff. Uh, hopefully she never leaves. We love you, Jennifer. Stay with us forever. Uh, and that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning in and being a part of the show. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And again, thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex Tarocco. Go check out her merch store. I don't know why I have our time saying merch sometimes. Merch in Dye's store at alexdraco.com. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref. You can hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on the KREF Sports app. I'm at John9Williams. But until next time, she's Alex. He's Josh. I'm John. Boomer. Sooner.